Welcome to the uh, latest episode of Sports Bazaar uh, with me, Mick Malloy, and of course, Titus O'Reilly. So, we've arrived. Here we are. It's been a journey. It's been an adventure. But we finally get to 1983 for our America's Cup series. This is it. All roads lead to here. What do we need to know? Uh, do we need to recap anything? Well, 1980, the Australians had lost 4-1. Yeah. And it'd been a bit of a shambles. But Bond's challenged three times. He now knows what he needs to know. And he realises if he's going to have any chance of ever winning this, yeah. 83 is the year. Because sure. it's just so expensive. Now or never. Yeah. <laughs> now or never. And so he decides if he's going to do it, everything has to be right. New boat. He needs to get the right people in the right place. Yeah. He has to do everything right. So he, he's looking at it. And he decided the first thing to do is he needs someone to head this all up. And he decides John Bertrand, who we've talked about many times, is the guy to do it. Sure. John Bertrand will become skipper. And what was he in 1980? So he'd, he'd become, remember he, he got brought in to do the, as tactician. Tactician but they, and then Ben Lex is dirtied up yeah. and uh, there's trouble at Mill. There's, there's trouble. So, But Ben Lex and, and Bertrand got along despite yeah. all that. So Bertrand was going to be the skipper and in charge of it. Bond would fund it. Ben Lexham would design the design it. So, so all the key people are sort of in place for this one. They know their their roles. They all know. Now, Bond rung Bertrand and said, I want you to be skipper. And he says, well, I'll go and have a quick think about it and come back. And uh, they'd been chatting. Anyway, Bertrand comes back and he goes and rings Bond and says, can I come meet with you in your office? And he comes in and he stands before Bond and he says, I would be honoured to accept your invitation to helm your new boat for a 1983 challenge in Newport for the America's Cup. Bertrand said he stood there for a few minutes dreaming of glory of the Mount Olympus we would climb together <laughs> for a few seconds. He says he was overwhelmed by the sheer nobility of it yep. all. Bond looks at him and goes, and he's waited six months for Bertrand to say yes, goes, talk to my solicitor and walks out. <laughs> That's everyone staying in their lane. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? That's everyone on point. So Bertrand, by this point, you know we haven't we've mentioned him briefly, but we haven't sure. really talked about him as a person. So, and we can say we're going to have him on tomorrow. So if you're listening to this when it Incredible. comes out, you and I sat down for an hour with yep. John Bertrand, and that's going to be going out on the actual anniversary Incredible. Uh, of it. So, but to give you an idea of uh, what it was like, he's he's always been obsessed. So if you remember right back, his great grandfather was involved in the lip. And uh, sh Shamrock Challenges. Okay. So, you know, he's literally got his great grandfather on America's Cup yes. boats going way back. And he grew up very close to a uh, sailing club here in Melbourne. Yes. And he used to go out with his grandpa's fishing boat and, and he'd sail a little fleet of toy yachts behind. Like, <laughs> that's how, like Connor, it was like from birth. It was. He was. Yeah, he was a man in of his the, veins. He was a man of the sea. By 1962, he was the junior champion of Australia in sailing, um, and he became completely obsessed. He did a thesis for his engineering degree on the aerodynamics of the sails of 12 metre yachts. Okay. Very, very specific. It is specific. <laughs> I think he knew what he wanted to he do. He knew what he wanted to do. He then went to MIT to learn about the Americans, how they did sail design, and get a master's basically in yeah. how sails work. I love this story. It's so full on. Like, yeah. he's like, you know. It's not an accident. It's no. not just throwing the keys to a yacht and he goes, here, you ever yeah. go. I mean, when you look Don't back. Don't ding it. <laughs> everything. He'd even sailed with Dennis Connor to observe him. Yeah. And he said he was sitting there one time and he saw Dennis. He, so Dennis was obviously steering, was the skipper. Yes. And Bertrand, this is, you know, just offered to help on a few of the, you know, non-America Cup races in the lead up. Yeah. And they both wanted to, re Dennis was smart enough to go, I want to observe this guy. Yes. But he didn't really, because Dennis thinks a bit better of himself than everyone else. <laughs> he hadn't really realised that John was observing yeah, him. Yeah, of course. And he noticed that at one point Connor did this really nifty move at the start line. And just gave himself this very self-satisfactory smile. <laughs> and Bertrand saw this as a big insight into him. He said, he's I, showing his tricks. Yeah, he said, I realise at this moment that Dennis is a man who has to prove himself to himself all the time and he has to have his ego fed, although only he can really feed it. This is all part of his incredible drive. He also saw him as someone that you could be made to overthink and over. Right. Obsessed. And this becomes important in this okay. one, right? Uh, something to exploit? Something to exploit. So Bertrand's ready to go. 
Um, now, he puts a lot of rigor into the challenge. He starts to make sure he's a details guy. Yes. So he's suddenly making sure the right people are in every part, the sales are right, everything's going. Um, he wants all the teamwork right. He got a sports psychologist in, which in 1983 was unheard of, you know, to have a sports psychologist. Yes. And he identified that one thing the Australians need to do is just actually believe that they could be better than the Americans. Yeah. So this is where the idea of the boxing kangaroo gets invented for the America's mm-hmm. Cup in 1983 as the sort of the yeah, spirit. Okay. Man at works down under becomes the song. It's kind of like boxers entering an arena, yeah. wasn't it? But yeah. on water. That's so right. So they made a whole spectacle and there was all this energy attached to going out and sailing. Yeah, and it was, but a lot of it was aimed, Bertrand said, at his crew. Yeah. To say... They are no better than you. We can beat these guys. Don't you worry. So with all of that, he says, he, he meets with Bond and Lexon and he says, all I need you to do is give me a boat. I don't want anything crazy. I don't want anything experimental. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. I want straight down the line boat design that just gets me a quality with the Americans. It puts me in the hunt. Puts me in the hunt and then it's crew on crew and I reckon we can beat them. That's yeah. all I want. And he said the reason he'd done that is he knew, he, and he wanted it reliable. He didn't want it like breaking apart or as it su- like As it did in as subsequent it, years. Yeah. It and snapped in half and sank. Yeah, we, that happened to one of Australia's later ones, didn't it? So, you know, he was very like with, and he also said, this is his direct quote from Bertrand, Benny had designed some awful boats. So as much as Benny Lexham was a great designer, yeah. he tended to push the envelope. And it yeah. could sometimes be a bit much. He said, Benny had designed some awful boats. And for Alan Bond, he once designed a truly tragic boat, Apollo 3, a big 50-footer that may as well have been the greatest dog of all time. <laughs> and it was not so much that she would not go. She wanted to lie down and die. <laughs> okay, that's pretty solid criticism. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's the, like... From the Bertrand camp. So he's not thrilled with this. So he says... That's what I need. Keep it to simple. Do. Just, Keep it simple yeah. and reliable. They're the two things I want, right? Just it's a good brief. The problem was, and they didn't <laughs> say it. <laughs> yes. The problem was they didn't say it to him when he first brought this up. They agreed with him. Yeah. But Bond and Lexham, before Bertrand had come on board, yes, had decided the only way that haven't ha- they because while while Bertrand had been involved in a couple of the challenges under Bond and he'd yeah. been there under some of the Packer ones. He hadn't been quite as heavily involved as Lexon and Bond had all the way. Yes. Right? He'd definitely been part of it, but, you know, he, he was now the skipper. But they believe they knew more than he did about right. what the Americans were like and what was needed. And they had decided almost as soon as they lost in 980, Bond and Lexon had sat down and said to, to beat the 132-year-old hold on the cup, mm. we need a boat with a wildly radical design. <laughs> Good Lord. <laughs> So Bertrand's going around getting the crew ready, yeah. getting everything standing around. And Bond has sent Lexan off to strategize. And Lexan comes back with this master stroke that turns the whole yacht world upside down. And it's an, you know, so a normal keel under a boat, anyone that knows even something vaguely about a thing, it's sort of wide at the top. It's like a fin almost in the water, but straight sides, a keel. Yeah. He decides to invert it a bit. It's thinner at the top, wider at the bottom, then has wings coming out on each side so it's called the winged keel it's revolutionary right? it's re- it's revolutionary here these wings are, are big now they show this to bertrand <laughs> on paper <laughs> how'd that go down bertrand said bondy finally showed so bertrand gets wind that they're up to something because he's like asking to see the plans for the boat he's got to sail this is years out yes. he's going where's the where's the plans where's, where's the my plan? boat yeah where's you know Where's the designs? Because, yeah. you know, Bertrand's got a master's in engineering. You know, he's yeah. sailing and engineering. He's an engineer in background. Sure. So he's not, he's not like, a, it's not like a, a race car driver asking to see. He, he what literally, have you, what have yeah, what have you got me? He literally knows, even just looking at the plans, what's going on. He understands. <laughs> he's, not, he's not a moron, right? He's a very yeah. smart man. So Bertrand says, Bondi finally showed me his precious new plans. He unrolled them and spread them out. And my eyes were riveted at these grotesque images of a new concept in keel design. I nearly flipped. After all that I had told him, no gambles, no risks, no trick boats, just put me in there on equal terms. Benny turns up with something that looks like a bloody rocket underneath my cockpit. (laughs) Fantastic. (laughs) So so he's not thrilled, right? But Bertrand uh, starts looking at it and they start doing some testing. 
and they actually go to the Netherlands to do some testing in some of the right. um, some of the pools over there. They have sort of like it's equivalent of basically like wind tunnels, a wind tunnel, yeah, but for boats, for boats right? Yeah, so. This causes controversy down the track because there's always been a bit of a thing. Oh, as no, you're not allowed to go to another country. Y- well, you that, are. That was one of the You're rules. allowed to go and to do some of that stuff. You just The design can't come from the people over there. So right. there was a bit of a thing where, where the Dutch inventor or Ben Lexon invented it. My research and everything I've read is the one thing that kind of convinces me that Ben Lexon, I'll get this out of the way now, because there were sort of claims by the Dutch like 30 years later and the Americans at the time to try and get the wind keel banned. Yeah, muddy the water. Muddy the water is that they must have got some help from the, the Dutch engineers, not just in the testing of it, but in the actual design. Now, the one thing that's kind of interesting about this that I think is telling is there's quite a few documents from the time, telexes and various documents like that, that categorically proved Lex and invented it. Great. And so it's easy to come back there years ago and go, oh, actually it was us. But when you've got written proof from the time... I could see the New York Club taking that on the chin. Yeah, yeah, they were there. Oh, about Go about your business. <laughs> so when they're overdoing it, though, in there and they're testing this before they build it, it works. And Bertrand starts to... His engineering mind starts to go, okay, now I kind of right. see what you're doing. It's not as crazy as it was. Um, and they all get a bit excited because here's an edge. Um, here's something new about it. But they're debating about, do we actually build this? And the idea of it, it will be that the boat will be able to turn much, much faster in the water. Right. Right. That's the idea that's of it. That's basically the key. That's, that's the key that's of it, what yeah. what gives you the advantage for the wind kill. Yep. It, it almost like root to in place in the water so you can very quickly almost turn on a dime. Okay. And and so that's really what it is. Makes you your turns very quick, fast, but almost in place. Yeah. So they still don't know it's going to work. They've got all the testing, but they don't know it's going to work. It's all we all know now what happens, but at yeah. the time they didn't know. Yeah. And they're all looking at it. They're going, it's good enough that we could risk it. But Bertrand's also saying, it is a risk though. We know we've got boats that are very close to the Americans, if not equal. Do so we, they have to choose. They can't develop. To, it's like, very ex- your standard thirty-two regular and this revolution. There are design. times when the Americans do this later on in American Cup races where they build several boats. Connors is the first to do, do this it, a few yeah. times and stuff. But it's very expensive, sure. and you know they're sort of having to decide. And so they have this long debate and bond, and it was his money. Just finally looked at them all and said, "Build it." And that was it. And Bertrand said that was the strength of Bond. He actually made the decision, we're just going to plow ahead and do it. And they build the thing, they build the boat with the the wing keel, and they name it Australia 2. So they now have a boat. Now, when they first take it out for a a ride, um, they're actually going around. And Bertrand said that he first just goes for about a mile and a half, and it's all fine. It's nothing exciting. Yeah. And then he goes, and he said, and then I decided to turn around and sail windward. And at that moment, I knew something was afoot. Australia 2 did not merely turn or even turn fast. She ripped a, whipped around faster than any boat I've ever sailed. It felt almost like a turn on a hairpin bend. She spun tighter and faster, her wing keel, keel holding her magically almost on a dime. Here we go. So this is what we've got, right? This changes the whole tactics and... Okay. techniques that the Amer- Australians can now do that no one else can do. All right. right. Now, this is still under wraps, the keel and the whole... This is strategy. under wraps. The Americans at this point don't know about it. This is when they're first... So where are they doing this, it. off Fremantle? No, they, yeah, they do it there and they race a bunch of ones in um, even in the uh, P- P- Phillip Bay as well. Okay. So they do a bunch of different ones, testing it all over the place. But they're keeping it very secret. So then in 1983, there's seven challenges for the Cup competing, and it's the inaugural uh, Louis Vuitton Cup. And this is where all the international teams now officially compete to find out who's going to challenge. Yep. And it's all set up now. Remember in the old days, it was just you wrote a letter. (laughs) Now it's fully... I like those days. I know, they were good days. And there's rumours of this revolutionary new keel development. And so this is amongst all the defence, all the people challenging, they're getting a bit nervous and... So is the defender, the Americans. And Australia 2 just absolutely smokes the entire field in the, in the qualifying to become the challenger. Connor is so worried about everything to do with this that he actually does a deal confidentially with the New York Yacht Club. And what he does is he 
rates Liberty his boat with different sailing configurations, three different ones that all suit different conditions, and got them all ticked off. So you, with the New York Lot Club to race. So, so what, what that does means that is mean normally you go and say, this is my boat, this and they the measure it all, they make sure it fits with the ratings, yeah, and that's it, you... That's your boat. Does that, that you're include racing. the set of sails? That's everything, right? And then what he was doing is he then goes to them and say, and and that's all kind of public. He does this secret deal. That says I also want to write, like get ratings for because you have to be officially ticked off. Yeah. As it, the boat's legal. I want to set the boat up in completely different ways with different levels of ballast and different, all different... With the idea that he will ultimately choose one or that he'll have three separate designs and over I, the seven so, races. So say one day, the, so the, give it a real layman's terms for this. So say one day he's got a rating for a boat that's set up for light conditions yes. and smooth sea, so he might have very light ballast in it. Yeah. And then the next day it's going to be really choppy so he puts heaps of ballast on the boat, which no one else is allowed wow. to do. He's allowed to tweak the boats, basically, the boat in between. I know what I know about the New York Yacht Club. They would have said no. They Dennis, say that is not within the spirit of the competition. They they say yes, <laughs> tick off all three. But he does this at, it, during the Defender trials against the other Americans. So he's using it during the <laughs> Defender trials. Well, he get he 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 gets. Are people them, aware he's setting his no, boat up differently? No, it's secret. What is going on? Jeez. So when the Americans are going to start throwing dispersions like... at the Australians, oh, yeah. that's what Dennis Connor's doing, right? Dennis is getting he's basically, around the rules. He's got it's a three loophole. boats. See, the thing he is, anyone three else... three boats. He can pick one of three well, boats three depending bo on the, the conditions. The same boat, but set up three yeah, different but, ways. But I'm saying to you, that's three three different boats. Well, the thing is, everyone else has always gone and just rated, rated their boat, right? That's the way. He, he goes to them and goes... I can do it in three different configurations. And they go, yeah, sure. But they don't tell everyone else it's okay to do this. He's found a leap loophole and they just keep it quiet like a gentleman's agreement between them wow. and him. So the Americans are still very spooked, even though they've now got the man they want, Connor Racing, yeah. that they decide, well, why don't we... <laughs> One thing we could do is we could launch legal challenges against Australia and their winged keel. They don't know it's winged, but what, whatever yeah, they've what got. Right? going on down there. So they and they just it drives them nuts that they haven't seen it. So they've, we know they sent divers below because Bertrand told you and I that he caught them. That they, <laughs> they caught them. All Helicopters right. are above. Nothing works. They're losing their mind. So they decide to launch legal challenges. So they send people over to Holland to try and figure out if they can find any allegations that the Dutch invented it, not the Australians. They yeah. can't. Australia starts to respond with documents that prove they've got it. Yeah. Um. The New York Yacht Club write, write to the ratings. People have already ticked off Australia 2 as legal and they reaffirm that Australia 2 is legal. Yeah. So the New York Yacht Club then write to the International Yacht Racing Jeez. Union to question the legality of it and ask for the entry to be disqualified. Wow. The Australians point out that, hang on, twice we've been rated as a legal 12-metre yacht um, by the body you said would be independent body that you said you'd accept their views. Yes. You've then complained to them again and gone and complained to a higher body yes. who doesn't have any say in this, yeah. by the way. So, <laughs> so the, the, this body doesn't have any say. Um, and now it's all over the shop and, you know, what are you doing? The International Yacht Racing Union come back and c concludes anyway that Australia 2 is eligible to compete and legal. So the Americans are losing their minds, right? They are yeah. trying everything. Even worse, the head of the British syndicate revealed that um, that it's common knowledge that the International Yacht Racing Union has um, ticked off on wing keels. They all sort of know it's a wing yes. keel without knowing what it looks mm. like. And so they're legal, so that doesn't make any sure. And then it comes to light that the New York Yacht Club, which has been trying to get this whole thing um, knocked off the boat, attempted to buy this design from the Dutch one of the other defensive defending syndicates had really? earlier tried to buy the wing keel from the Dutch. Okay. And the Dutch said, no, the Australians have come up with it Says. and we're working for them. We can't sell it to you. So it becomes a bit funny when they're trying to buy it to then turn around and go, <laughs> then outlaw it. Then ban it, right? So it comes down to the Americans are looking at this. They're like toddlers. <laughs> they're behaving like spoiled children. 
So the New York Yacht Club at this point think this is the gravest challenge we've ever faced, right? We've yeah. got people who know what they're doing, like this wing kill that we don't know, but it seems very good and we can't get it banned. But it's still really up to the New York Yacht Club. They, they, you know, they can still... So they actually have a meeting like a few days before and they start saying, could we cancel this? Could we cancel, right, cancel the, the, whole America's the, the, all the challenge and the everything? We're not happy with how it's all going. Mm-hmm. Do they need specific grounds? Or no. Can they well, just go, you've you know seen what? before they've they've changed the rules before, right? They're not, you know. Ultimately, they, you know, they'd they'd be laughed at, but they're kind of like going, "Oh, do we come up with some ways to, you know, just say this is not okay?" Which they have the power to do, right? They'd look silly, but they have the power to. Do. Would look silly. Alan Bond comes in and says, "Well, I'll sue you for half a billion dollars, <laughs> US." <laughs> He's got his costs. He's like, yeah, his- I'll sue you. It's fine. I'll sue you. Like yeah. Bond's quite happy to go legal challenges. He's like, it's all legal. Isn't I'll it? I'll sue you. It's a boat race. So they back down. They go, okay, we're going to do it. Now, part of all this happening at the same time and after this decision is the mind games. So the Australia is Australians are so angry. The Americans have kept trying to ban them that they just they see this actually as a weakness. Yes. So they're going. We're not. We're no longer intimidated by this nonsense. You're weak. Um, let's turn the mental torture up to 11. <laughs> so, as well as the f- boxing kangaroo, the anthem, the men at work down under, Bond had a big, huge launch um, that he would, big ship, you know, that he would, big luxury yacht, that he would, yeah. before races, park out the front of the New York Yacht Club and pay men at works down under at the top of the volume <laughs> right so he just decides i'm going to put if you want to this try and muck great. us around i'm going to muck you around though right? that was yeah. the one thing bond did very well he'd also turned up to this challenge with a golden wrench that he said he would use to unbolt the cup from the plinth <laughs> that was tied. So the Americans had the, the yeah. cup tied down, yeah, like yeah, bolted, right, down. bolted down. So he had this gold wrench that he would walk around with mm-hmm. and say, that's just what's happening. I've got this already. This is what's going to untie it. I hope so, the Dutch didn't design that wrench. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. That's so, hilarious. Yeah, so he's absolute. The Americans are just losing their minds. But around the wing keel, the Americans, after trying to ban it, and try and work out what to do. It was still driving them nuts. Warren Jones, who was Bond's right-hand man and com- campaign manager, said of campaign of the America's Cup, said the interest in our boat and what was below the waterline became intense as the New York Yacht Club pulled out all the stops to pin down what we had. Um, we turned into a positive and reduced the pressure by playing games with the New York Yacht Club. He says they were really quite a mess psychologically. <laughs> So we're up to the races, right? This is where the races are happening. And we've covered all the history now of why this is 132 years. No one has won it. In Australia, America's Cup, because we've challenged four times, is now front page news all the time. It's a big sporting story. Huge sport. Australia's gone through terrible, bad economic times in the early 80s. The country's divided. We'd had Whitlam into Fraser. You know, Australia is very deeply divided politically. Its economy was shot. We were in a dangerous drought. Yep. All these terrible things were going on. We had a new Prime Minister in Bob Hawke and Paul Keating, who had just started. And we'd also only won nine medals, none of them gold, at the um, uh, 980 Moscow Olympics where we boycotted. Yes. And we'd only won five at the Montreal Games four years later. So we were like starved. Uh, On the international sporting stage... We not, haven't been covered in glory Nothing. of late. So everyone is desperate for some good news. Yep. And the Americans trying to ban us and all this stuff going on and Bond over there with the boxing kangaroo and yep. men at works down and stuff has just got this whole Australian population just watching this. Yep. They're getting up to watch it every night. It's on television live. You know, this is before yep. internet. Papers wall to wall. So we can't capture how much it means at the time. It was huge. I remember. You know. So race one starts, and Australia two is in the lead, and her steering gear breaks, and so almost amaz- immediately her spinnaker collapses. She can barely sail. Yeah, and she still only loses by a minute ten, but is a big problem. Sure. And this is partly what Bertrand had been worried about with the revolutionary ex- idea. Yeah, race two, Australia two's main um, halyard comes unlocked. And the head of the mainsail rips off. So this is okay. already 
they shouldn't have even been able to sail, but they managed to, with their other sails, still lose by minute 33. Minute 33. Americans gaining a little bit of confidence. Yeah, yeah. that we're two deal down. So this big challenge that had Connor and everyone so worried about, our, yeah. the Australia 2 has not got through a race without something breaking. Yep. So it's a it's looking bad. Okay. <laughs> race three, the Australia's win, but the time limit expires because a race must be finished in five hours and fifty minutes and the win doesn't count. Of course it doesn't. It's a win. So Australia's win. Now in fairness, that is one of the that is just right. true, right? So so technically they win, but it takes too long to race at all and it times up and the win doesn't count. So it's still two nil. Race three's run and Australia Two wins. Keeps themselves in Here it. It's now go. two one. Race four, Connor and his team sail an absolute perfect race. Every wind shift goes their way. They don't make any mistake. Um, and still they only win by forty three seconds. But now the Australians are now down three one in the series. Um, and wow. basically they're in real trouble. Like it's just looking like if they, they have to win every race from here or yep. they're over. So the mood in Australia is oh, well, it's, you know, you know, it's hearts like, are sinking. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you know, no one comes back from solemn. this really. Yeah. Solemn. Australia two win the next race by one minute forty seven seconds, and this makes it three two, and they become the first challenger since nineteen thirty four to take two mm. cup races in a series. There we go. Then a malfunction of Liberty in the sixth race helps Australia to tie the score and suddenly it's 3-3. An exasperated... We're back, baby. A reporter in the Augusta Chronicle wrote, Who are these brash, nut-brown sailors from the bottom of the world who dare to seize the lumpy old silver ewer, which has not left the United States in 132 years? Uh, the Americans are starting to get... <coughs> it's on. Very annoyed. So the seven race is on. Whoever wins this one this race, it. it's this is it. This is the one where all everyone everyone hunched around the TV, black and white. Absolutely, early. the the it's dubbed the race of the century. Now the media attention in America and Australia is just off the charts because this is 132 years longest ever sporting, yeah. you know, uh, streak winning streak. You know, this is just huge news. Yes. It's big news in England because England have challenged so many times. So. Huge it's got interest in attention. this. The crowds all gather. There's a huge crowd there out on the water and just around any vantage point that can see this around Rhode Island. The two cre crews have really built up a good sort of rivalry here. Liberty sails from the dock to the tune of the Rocky theme. <laughs> Australia to return fire with men at works land down under. So yeah. they sail out. Um, moments before the showdowns to begin... The Americans call for a lay day, postponing the race 24 hours due to what? light winds. The Australians call the decision a disgrace and remark they can't run forever. They've got to face a someday. On what grounds did they ask for a lay day? Not enough wind. Well, why don't we run it like they the one we did? They think Australia 2 does better in the light wings. So, um, Well, the New York Yacht Club would have had none of that. None of that. So they come back. What do you mean? Uh, they they, come they back got to, a later. Yeah, they got a later. <laughs> so they've delayed it. Finally, the 26th of September, it's on again. And it's shown live in Australia again it's just before dawn. Watching parties held everywhere. I can remember going to one yeah. as a kid, sleeping and getting woken up for the actual sure. race, you know, as, yes. as a five-year-old. Um, it was absolutely huge. Connor and his crew, they they like the conditions. It's Monday afternoon over there. They really like the conditions, right? Um, all of Australia, the legal challenge, the wing kill, blonde, Bond's glamour and everything, the comeback to get it to 3-3 three, three means in Australia, the whole like country is yeah. nuts. The race is ready to start. Now, on that exact same day, and we didn't know this too much later, a Soviet military officer, uh, Petrov, averted a p possible nuclear war by correctly identifying a US missile attack warning in Moscow as a false alarm. But that wasn't the most important event that day. No. That was this. The race started and the Australians start incredibly poorly. And they are looking way behind. It looks like it could almost be over yeah. before it starts. They recover and they start to get back in it. And suddenly it's on. And the lead changes three times. But then Liberty get ahead and they round the final windward mark with a lead of 57 seconds. Oh, Bond is so sure it's over. 
he goes down to the cabin of his uh, ship, the Black Swan, and he actually gets called back onto the deck because Australia 2 is gaining on liberty. Bertrand's decided he's going to split the course on the downward fifth leg, which basically means he goes one way, Connor yeah. goes the other. They're not Here racing side by side. See you at the finish line. And he catches a breeze, and Australia 2 start rapidly making up ground. But they're still far back. Australia 2 begins to get close to Liberty and they try to start stealing Liberty's wind by getting in the way. And Australia 2 starts to work. It's it's in the way of the wind and is blocking yeah. Liberty. Liberty, and they then get really just caught in trying to really just jibe against each it's other. So one maneuver. makes a move, the other yeah. makes a move. <laughs> and But the way it's coming is it's going well for Australia. It is gaining ground, um, you know, every single moment. Um, Connor says later, two quick jibes and we paralleled her on port jibe. Then, as if using a propeller or those trick wings on her keel, the boat started sailing lower and faster than we could. In the final third of the run to the last mark, Australia 2 is suddenly getting in there with Connor right side by side. The boats are literally getting closer and closer. They do one of those jibes where one boat's going the other way. Yes. The other ones, they almost crash. And it's getting incredibly nervy. But then suddenly the Australians are a boat, boat length clear. And they've seized the command. They're in the commanding position in terms of where the wind is and where the boy is that they've got yep. to go around. And they're parallel with Liberty. And so in a space of 4.4 miles, Australia 2 has taken 1 minute and 18 seconds out of the Americans and leads by just 21 seconds with one leg to finish. Dennis Connor utters annoyed. Does anyone here have anyone? Does anyone here have any ideas? <laughs> but Connor is not. Connor's not some loser. Connor is right. an amazing captain. So skipper. So he's down, but he starts to say, "Well, we're only just behind them." So he decides on the last leg to launch what is a stunningly aggressive set of moves. He tacks you know 47 times against the australians and each time the australians have to yes. meet every tack to try and tactically keep him out and bet the best position <laughs> exhausting now the thing is at any point while australia 2 it's very hard that's going to that connor to get past australia 2 only you need to make one mistake yes. and you and i know because we've spoken to john bertrand directly about mm. this and there'll be more of this in tomorrow's show one mistake and straight to it's over. are stuffed. Yeah. <laughs> so this whole thing comes down to these last 47 tacks My as the God. Australians match Connor on every single one to try and keep their position. He's not going quietly. He's not going quietly. And they sail it absolutely perfectly. They do not let him pass. And they go past the committee boat and the gun is fired and the America's Cup... <laughs> has become the property of the Royal Perth Yacht Club. 132 (laughs) years of history. The longest winning streak in sport is over. I've got goosebumps. And the place absolutely erupts. Incredible. Australia 2 is boarded by Alan Bond and the rest of the team and chaos ensues. The America's Cup is (laughs) finally going to be unbolted from the New York Yacht Club and it's in the most dramatic race that the America's Cup has ever seen. Australians celebrate this victory with a ferocity usually reserved for the end of a war. <laughs> exactly right. Well, these were we triumph. Get, we get the great quote from Bond, which said, this is Australia's greatest victory since Gallipoli. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as the ceremony, a ceremony is held um, after the race, and John Bertrand says, I'm pr- very proud, I feel very humble. He raised the trophy alongside Ben Lexon and Alan Bond. They all raise it together bond has invested over 16 million dollars in four attempts to get to this point which in the 80s and 70s money is a lot of money um amid all these wild celebrations bond orders and you there's great images online it's night time there's champagne going everywhere incredible Incredible bond ordered australia 2's wing keel to be revealed and the boats lifted up this time without its modesty skirts yep and there it is for all to see the upside down keel shape it's just an amazing image and thing the australians joke ben lexon says they're going to get the cup and run it over with a steamroller and rename <laughs> it a, the america's plate <laughs> in the background as the boat's been lifted out and the wing keel's being shown dennis connor quietly clambers across some diggings in the background um in tears because yeah. he's so he's just a broken man because of it 
millions of revelers, Aussies, have stayed up throughout the night back home in Australia. Yeah. It is going absolutely nuts. Car horns, everything. The nation is absolutely loving it. Prime Minister Bob Hawke, he's drenched in champagne. <laughs> he's at the Royal Perth Yacht Club. Yes. He's been up all night. Yeah. He's had a few. He's in a white Australia jacket. Like, it's a white... Yes, suit jacket, but with Australia written. You've seen this yeah. and the map on Which it. Which he's put on over the top of another jacket. Yeah, it's, it's, insanity. it's bonkers, right? He is absolutely um, loving it, yeah. just having a ball. And someone says to him, all the media keeps saying, can we have the day off? Can we have the day off, Prime Minister? Because it's <laughs> Monday morning yes. over there. Can we have the day off? And he famously says... Um, any boss who sacks anyone for not turning up today is a bum. <laughs> Famous. <laughs> Famous moment. That should be on our Parliament House yeah. or something. Uh, in a more sober moment, Hawke and President Ronald Reagan exchanged telegrams of thanks and congratulations. So, you know, they're quite honourable, the Americans in this part. Connor sat under TV lights just being absolutely torn to shreds by the American press. Sure. And tears streamed down his face as he spoke. Um but he said weirdly, that touched the Americans more than when they used to win. He said, I used to get you know a couple of letters after defending because he successfully defended in 1980. He got about 100 letters, he said. That's not very much. After losing, I got tens of thousands of letters. Wow. And he obviously comes back to win it. Of uh, course. In 88. Did he ever have a moment with Bertrand? Did he ever go and shake hands? Did he ever get off the boat? And yeah, I think they were... I, I haven't... They don't mention that, but they were... They got along well enough, you know? They were pretty... There's a lot of respect. A lot of respect between them all. Um, at the White House Rose Garden, President Ronald Reagan and Vice President George Bush, a senior, formally hand over the American Cup to the Australian Australians. Oh, um, Australia award... Alan Bond, the Order of Australia, the AO, for distinguished service of a high degree to Australia or humanity at large. That's how much it means. Yep. In 1989, the Toyota Lexan was released by Toyota <laughs> Australia in Ben Lexan's honour. It was a rebadged Holden VN Commodore. Yep. A lot of us might remember that. Um, and, of course, John Bertrand, who we're going to talk to tomorrow, he goes on to be head of Swimming Australia and a, a very accomplished business person. admired. Now, many people believe that taking the wing keel out of the water during the celebrations was a mistake. A lot of people have raised that over the years. By revealing, so? by revealing the keel, the Aussies in one swift, swift move gave away the edge that they worked so hard to obtain, the IP, and the rest of the world caught up instantly. And it may have cost the Aussies the cup in 987 when Connor won it back. Ben Lexon in finishing up... Did he win it back with the wing keel? He had a, a, a much more advanced using some of that technology. Right. Yeah, it had moved on obviously a bit, but no, so some right. people have said it was a mistake doing that. Ben well, Lex, it was going to happen. Well, I don't think you can keep well, I think a that, secret for three years. Well, that's years right. With, it's very hard to know, but let's leave it to Ben Lex and maybe to have the final word on this. Sure. Ben Lex was asked if he ever regretted showing the keel. No, he said. How could you? It was such a wonderful party. <laughs> <laughs> and Brilliant. that is how the Australians won the America's Cup. It's been a magnificent journey. Thank you so much for taking the time to research that and just enlighten us. There's so much lurking under the surface. We know the headlines. We've got a kind of fading memories of the time. Hmm. But the level of detail in this has been extraordinary. And uh, we thank you very much. Titus O'Reilly.